to our uh, discussion this morning. So, so this panel this morning uh, will be discussing uh, our recent book, Political Economy of Palestine, Critical Interdisciplinary Decolonial Perspectives. Um, my colleague Ibrahim and I will be uh, sharing with you a little bit about our work, a little bit about that book. Um, my name is Tim Seidel. I teach at Eastern Mennonite University, EMU, in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Um, and the, sort of the, the order of the show here will be, I'm going to take a few minutes to introduce the book, uh, then hand it over to Ibrahim, who will talk a little bit about political economy. I'll come back to the stage and give you uh, a little bit of a presentation on my chapter, uh, my contribution to the book, and then we'll hand it over back to Ibrahim, and then we'll have some plenty of time for some Q&A and some conversation um, about these really important issues. Um, So our book, here's a, a picture of uh, the cover, Political Economy of Palestine. I had the uh, pleasure of co-editing with uh, Drs. Al-Hakir and Dr. Dana. Um, our book explores the political economy of occupied Palestine. And it argues that an approach to economics that doesn't consider the political, a depoliticized economics, is inadequate to understanding the situation in occupied Palestine. It outlines a critical interdisciplinary approach that challenges prevailing neoliberal logics and structures that reproduce racial capitalism and explores how the political economy of occupied Palestine is shaped by processes of accumulation, um, by exploitation, and by dispossession and displacement. By both Israel and by global business, as well as from Palestinian elites. It also explores a decolonial approach to uh, Palestine that foregrounds settler um, uh, foreground struggles against neoliberal and settler colonial policies and institutions. It explores the settler colonial present that continues to fragment Palestine and Palestinian life and land, undermining Palestinian sovereignty, political sovereignty, food sovereignty, all these things we were just talking about, um, perpetuated by the Oslo Accords, but whose histories of de-development over all of Palestine go back for over a century. Right? This approach traces that colonial history that even predates 1948. Um, and the impact of capital on social and political relations, including the capture and integration of Palestine into a global system, a global economic system, although in a peripheral position. Over 25 years have passed since the signing of the Oslo Accords, beginning an institutionalization wedded to neoliberal dreams of an economic peace. From Oslo to the halt of USA to the PA and UNRWA to freezing of tax transfers to the PA from Israel to the Trump administration's quote unquote deal of the century and the optimism around the role of global business in creating quote unquote peace to the bilateral agreements normalizing relations between Israel and Arab states such as the United Arab Emirates. We believe making sense of the last quarter century requires a critical understanding of political economy that turns on the colonial question. And we edited this volume with the goal of a deeper analysis of these regional and international developments. Uh, the contributions to this volume offer, this gives you a sense of all the, the wonderful uh, contributions that we had a, uh, just a privilege, just sort of collaborative, intellectual, uh, scholarly project. Um, the contributions to this volume offer an in-depth contextualization of the Palestinian political economy. Analyze the political economy of integration, fragmentation, inequality, and explore and problematize multiple sectors and themes in the absence of sovereignty. Um, with particularly salient implications for peace, like for peace building and development, uh, this volume details how ongoing events in the region demonstrate once again the failures of economic the need for a politics of solidarity, and a reminder that to be anti-colonial, uh, one must also be anti-capitalist. In the absence of sovereignty, so this critical politi political economy approach reveals not only how Palestine is economically dependent, but continues to be politically dependent and fragmented, as well as sort of contra the facade of an ostensibly post-colonial political status that the PA might be supposed to represent, um, which only serves to perpetuate indirect control, direct, indirect control of settler colonial powers. Um, Israel and the US benefits from this. Global business 
glimpses of a decolonial reality have emerged, and continue to emerge, for example, with what, what some are calling the Unity Intifada, uh, as well as with land-based struggles and resistance, um, all the while recognizing this has not displaced, right, politically, these fragmenting, epistemically and materially, these fragmenting Attention to settler colonialism is not limited to a focus on Israel and the international communities obstructing the establishment of a viable independent Palestinian state. A decolonial view also sees the objective as erasure and elimination, or at least Palestinians as permanent subjugated uh, status denied political and economic sovereignty, cheap labor removed from land. Over these last decades, the Oslo process diverted many intellectual efforts towards the illusion of liberal state building and economic development, involving technical exercises influenced by international financial institutions like the World Bank or other donor agencies, uh, distracting much scholarship uh, from the impacts of Israel's settler colonial projects. So given the hollow and decontextualized conclusions of Oslo-inspired uh, research the past two decades have witnessed a resurgence of studies that have deconstructed the very meaning of peace in the Oslo context and unpacked the Israeli matrix of control over all of Palestine. And our volume is an effort to contribute to that scholarship, not only for the sake of producing knowledge, but also for transforming this knowledge as a force for social, economic, and political change. And in her concluding chapter, uh, the um, privilege that the political economist Sarah Roy uh, wrote the conclusion of our book, uh, Professor Roy points out that if the role of authority is to obfuscate, then the role of the intellectual is to reveal. She writes that knowledge production is itself a form of resistance, making the role of the intellectual a part of resistance. And her conclusion underscores uh, our book's themes on critique as an act that historicizes, offering powerful stories that foreground the erasures, right, that logic of elimination, some of of colonialism, and the book's approach, uh, the book's decolonial approach, that understands this work as both a material and an epistemic project. Um, if we have time, I want to share more about these neoliberal dreams, maybe in the Q&A, because I recently uh, uh, re-listened to the Reith, Edward Said's Reith Lectures from 1993, where he talks about the gods that always fail. And that comes back to mind, I think, about these neoliberal dreams of economic peace that continue these gods that continue to require sort of living inside of these dreams. Um, and our book is an effort to both um, find new dreams and uh, articulate maybe the vocation of the intellectual um, as um, um, this man who this spell these dreams. Um, in that first year seminar. 
And so the reason I mentioned the new school and the heterodox or non-mainstream approach to economics is because a lot of it focuses on the idea of political economy. Now, sometimes I feel, I don't know if this is, if I, I let me just call it, I feel there's a limited understanding of what political economy means in the sense that some would think, well, let's just combine the political and the economic. That, that's not particularly, you know, wrong. That's the word. You see, when you're, if English is not your first language, it, it becomes a bit difficult. It's not particularly wrong, but I feel a lot of people then think of international relations. They're like, okay, the relationship between Russia and Germany because of gas and energy is blah, blah, blah. Or the game theoretical relationship between the Palestinians and the Jews. You start thinking in those terms, and I think you then miss some of the core of what political economy is. And what I believe the core of political economy is, is actually something that some of the first people first Whenever I use quotes, it means ask me about it in the Q&A. The first people to talk about um, economics, um, who we call the classical economists, so Adam Smith, David Ricardo, Mill, Malthus, Jean-Paptiste Say, um, those people did not study economics. It was not called economics when they studied it. It was called political economy. And the idea was that they would talk about politics Society, power, class, money, and distribution. And I think that is one inclusive way of looking at political economy, which I believe many, if not all of our authors, uh, uh, in the book follow. So it's interesting, that, um, again, this is not going to be a course in the history of economic thought, but you started, those people who wanted to talk about economics realized that you can't talk about economics if you're not talking about society and power dynamics and class. Sometime in the late 19th century, a group of economists wanted to be that. They wanted to be scientists. So these are people who were really infatuated with physics. Um, and they really wanted economics to be a science. And since then, they're called the marginalist uh, uh, economists. Since then, there's, this, there's been this continued effort to mathematize economics, to focus on the quantitative aspect of economics, the statistical aspect of economics, rather than focusing on, again, what I believe is, is probably the core um, of what political economy is, talking about power, class, uh, um, society, money, and those uh, uh, relationships that you have there. The last point that I would say about that is a question that I, you know, I always put in, in my presentations is, why is that important for us? So why is it important that we understand political economy in that inclusive manner? Well, first is obviously, I mean, what Tim mentioned, I mean, if anybody knows anything about Palestine, they would realize that it's absurd to talk about Palestine in the sense of market economy or the sense of market relations by themselves. So I mean, that, that I think is the first part. But the second part is that emphasis on class. I think it's very important that if we don't talk about class, then some of the main ramifications of the Israeli occupation are not discussed. And by that, I mean the basically proletarianization of Palestinians after 1948, but particularly after the occupation of 1967, and, uh, and we have some people who do really good work on that, also that class development that happened after the 1990s. Um, and so, uh, you know, and again, you were talking in your presentation about how a lot of capital came back after the 1990s, particularly from the Gulf. Um, Adam Hennie has a great uh, uh, article about this where he really talks about where that wealth and money comes from. But you created a new class of Palestinian, you want to call them capitalists, you want to call them employers, you can call them whatever you want. But it, it created a new class with the establishment of the Palestinian Authority, with the establishment of non-governmental organization and these professions that started. If you do not talk about political economy, and you really want to focus on the neoclassical way of looking at economics, 
going to talk a lot about the shortcomings of that in my presentation. I think you're missing a lot of what is really happening in Palestine. And the third and last thing is really what's been going on recently in the last few months in, in Palestine. So um, again, people here might be following or not following as closely what's going on in Palestine, but there's been a rise of several militant groups in the West Bank uh, recently. And a lot of these uh, militant groups have basically risen because the Palestinian Authority, supposedly the authority that protects the Palestinian people, has not been doing their job and has not been protecting the Palestinian people. And I think a very useful way of looking at that is thinking in terms of the political economy of this kind of comprador class that exists when you're talking, and I'm going to talk about this idea of dependency theory, you have a group within the society of the oppressed that aligns with the oppressor. And so when we talk about neoclassical economics and the market or the exchange uh, sphere of it, you're not going to be talking about that, which is, you know, I think a, a great shortcoming. I always tell my students, it's, it's just like this cup of coffee, right? There, two ways of looking at the transaction when you went and bought the coffee. If you want to be the neoclassical mainstream approach, you look at exchange. You look at the market. You went, you gave money, they give you coffee. coffee. You're happy because you wanted the coffee. You agreed on this price and they got the money. Everybody is satisfied from that transaction in the exchange market sphere. All we need to do is look at the production sphere, okay? Who produced these? Where did you get the beans? How were they paid? What is the relationship between them and their bosses, etc., etc.? That is the focus on production that neoclassical economics does not do. It merely wants us to focus on that market exchange factor because that is the political part of it that we don't want to talk about because we're a science and we use numbers. So um, that's, that's my, uh, my uh, defense for uh, needing to talk about political economy everywhere, but especially in, in Palestine. And um, I'm going to leave it now to Tim to talk about his chapter. I'll talk to you folks more about political economy and the dependency relationship um, in my chapter. the structures and processes of settler colonialism um, in, in, in Occupy Palestine, as well as land-based configurations, power struggle and resistance. Resistance that envisions alternative understandings of land and the everyday acts that express those visions. Um, in doing so, it begins to explore the contours of a decolonial approach that foregrounds land and the experience of indigeneity in the context of racialized settler colonialism an approach that also uncovers global anti-colonial inflections of that struggle. Uh, exploring settler colonialism in Palestine underscores this decolonial approach that not only gives attention to enduring indigeneity, uh, erasure, but also to the role of land in social and political economy in the struggle for autonomy, sovereignty, and self-determination. So I begin uh, the chapter discussing the settler colonial context of Palestine, its political economic impacts, I then engage a discussion on the means of decoloniality in order to better understand it, the context, and then finally uh, discussing this, uh, the current situation I explore land-based struggles. As political economies, um, particularly in parts of the occupied West Bank, under increasing threat of it, um, Israeli annexation. Uh, for example, uh, seeing this with Palestinian farmers in the Jordan Valley and their struggle for land reclamation and food sovereignty. Um, so settler colonialism. 
Um, Celtic colonialism as a, as a particular kind of colonialism is often characterized by its logic of elimination, right? That it's a structure, not an event. So attention to Celtic colonialism in Palestine within an indigenous framing aids um, in what we call the defragmentation of Palestine, the Palestinian land, the Palestinian land. Um, again, that Oslo perpetuated that, that, that whose, trace, whose history has been traced back for over a century. This framing throws into sharp relief the manner in which Palestinian political economy turns on the colonial question, um, underscoring the need for an epistemic and political commitment to decolonization. Holds the potential of working active, mutual, principled alliances of solidarity with struggles, with indigenous struggles around the world. Anti-colonial, internationalist approach that asserts um, the Palestinian struggle against Zionist settler colonialism can only be won when it's embedded within, powered by broader struggles. So in foregrounding this global view, a settler colonial lens within a framework of Palestinian indigeneity, quoting Steve Selecta, quote, lends itself to emphasis on sovereignty and self-determination as analytic and political categories, unquote. In contrast to an apartheid frame that envisions a political goal of full belonging within a nation state, another scholar, Mark Rifkin, argues that settler colonialism acknowledges distinct modes of sovereignty and self-determination uh, and self-definition. Um, and quoting Rifkin, names the imposition of the state over top of existing peoples whose prior presence makes them indigenous. This produces a set of demands um, in keeping with the imperatives of indigenous peoples throughout the globe. Autonomy, sovereignty, self-determination, imperatives that resonate with land-based struggle in Palestine. Um, Jake Kahalani Kawanui, uh, indigenous woman, talks specifically about decoloniality in the context of settler colonialism as an approach that gives attention to the erasure of history the history of erasure, which, which has as its point of departure the presence of indigenous writers and scholars. It also challenges the erasure of political economic activity that's not formal or not legible to the state or the market by articulating this political vision of pluriversality or other ways of sort of decoloning talking about that, that visibilizes land-based livelihoods and struggles their multiple networks of relationships. By challenging the erasure of informality, for example, this approach acknowledges uh, the simultaneity and the heterogeneity of everyday alternative worlds. So in, in the, the remainder of my chapter, I explore the ways in particular that steadfastness, sort of uh, this refusal um, uh, expressed in, in these sorts of everyday practices um, and livelihoods farming, agroecology, food sovereignty, land reclamation, articulated as resistance, as struggle, as refusal against displacement, against dispossession, against erasure. So in, um, um, throughout the history of settler colonialism, struggle against settler colonialism and the logic of racial capital um, have gone hand in hand. And the struggle against always been accompanied by the struggle for, right? the struggle for land, the struggle for a dignified life. Right? And that's also about, to quote Vergara Kimo, quote, challenging capitalist private property and rec reclaiming control over land, production, and reproduction. I, mean, I found it really helpful, the transactional history, you know, that's, that's a really helpful, it, you see how it just you pivot when you make that, when you make that shift in terms of what you're looking for. Here, decolonial political economy approach highlights the effects of commodifying land mentioned above, right? Land only seen, uh, only seen its exchange, exchange value uh, and not other forms of value, right? Commodification of land, instrument, instrumentalization of land, which, which um, uh, erases our relationships. The implication is that land, apart from its utility, is not seen. And so indigenous life in and relationship to that unseen land also goes unseen. It's why it can be said, and why it's been said throughout the history of settler colonies in Palestine, that it's empty, 
question, why do we send this land too in the United States and North America? It's empty, right? And why the Zionist claim of a quote, land without a people, was thinkable to begin with. Similar to other land-based struggles, key elements of a political economy of resistance in Palestine include small-scale farming, agricultural labor, uh, uh, food sovereignty, um, attention to the proletarianization you mentioned, and that, in a way you mentioned too yesterday, yeah, um, autonomy, mutual aid, as well as global solidarity, right? And the critical importance of political vision to guide economic priorities. Uh, throughout Occupy Palestine, the agricultural sector um, devastated uh, by Israeli and PA and other donor policies and practices. Um, as mentioned above, Area C um, includes much of uh, the West Bank's uh, land, uh, period, but also fertile land, uh, natural resources, etc., water um, that's under full military settler colonial control. Um, so in this context, food sovereignty has become a really interesting and important uh, framing and activity and struggle. Um, food sovereignty, right, means that people have control, control over their food, right, control over their food systems. Um, as uh, as Mithabar says, quote, the right to define their own policies and strategies for sustainable production, distribution, and consumption of food. Connotes a decolonial political economic commitment to indigenous sovereignty over land and resources. And we see this and really interestingly in other places, indigenous struggles expressed through food, efforts for food sovereignty, right? We claim food or, or, or reinvigorating food systems. Um, that, that, that shows up in places like Brazil with the MST and the Zapatistas in Mexico, um, Pueblo and Navajo communities here in the United States, as well as black farmers in the US, this idea of food sovereignty. So there's something there that connects these struggles with this logic of capital and silver colonialism in particular, right, uh, pushes up against. Given Israel's ongoing settler colonization of occupied Palestine and the expropriation of land, farmland, water resources, uh, the struggle for food sovereignty is key with restrictions on freedom of movement, regular attacks by Israel, Israeli settlers, settler violence against farmers, against plants against the land itself, um, agricultural restrictions imposed by Israel that cost the Palestinian economy billions of dollars a year, um, and that leave, uh, uh, let's say, about a third of Palestinians food insecure, and, and more Palestinian farmers becoming cheap labor on the other side of the green line, again, this proletarianization. As one, as one Palestinian farmer, Saad Agar says, quote, uh, we're a nation under Israeli occupation and we need to produce food that will make us stronger and more independent. We, we're no longer producing enough food. We've become dependent on the, productive, on the produce from illegal set, settlements which are full of pesticides, unquote, as one farmer. So the goal of food sovereignty not only creates alternatives to food aid, it reinforces this anti-colonial struggle, Right, connecting local food production um, to resistance around other resistance movements around the world, especially in the global south. Um, another expression of this, um, agroecology. Uh, agroecology offers uh, examples, offers additional examples of these efforts at food sovereignty as land-based struggles. Agroecology. Um, according to uh, Max Ahl's uh, recent work, quote, the application of scientific experimentation to and the formalization of processes underlying traditional farming systems. Agroecosystems offer an important support structure for Palestinians with its attention to soil health, uh, vulnerabilities due to climate-induced disruption, and Israel's southern colonization of the occupied West Bank. Um, I just uh, was announced yesterday that PGSA's conference next year is going to be in Ames, Iowa, which my mind went right to food systems. Um, and I, I, yeah, I hope that the, the conference, the four grounds, there's some really interesting work happening at the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas. And uh, a friend of mine that's up there today working on uh, these sorts of uh, perennial crops in Pal traditional, traditional perennial crops in Palestine, as opposed to other sorts of imported technologies of agriculture. Uh, yeah, maybe PGSA can pick this up next year. Um, 